Everybody happy today? It's on. It's on. It's not getting much power. All right. Well, while he works on that, I have one more thing to share with you. How many of you know we need to support each other? If the world goes under financially, the church ought to survive because if we just worked together and took care of each other, you know, it would be a whole lot. There, there's a lot we could do for each other. So I, I wanted to do this. I was not asked to do this. I asked to do this. But we've got two individuals in the church, Ina and Lori Dowdell. Where's Lori at? Raise your hand back here, and Ina's right here. And both of them serve and work around here a lot. They are working for... Uh, Liberty Tax and Liberty Tax of course it's a seasonal thing so it won't be very long but everybody gets their taxes done if you're not settled in somewhere and you're looking for somewhere to get your taxes done if you would go and see one of these two ladies and let them give you a flyer and uh, they will receive $50 for you having your taxes done there and you will get $50 cash back for having your taxes done there or you can apply it toward the cost of your taxes and everybody you refer thereafter, you can get $50. But I just wanted us to do this for these two ladies. They work around here and serve around the church, and, uh, and they need our help with that. Okay? All right, so if you will, they've got these. You'll need to have a certificate to go in and tell them who sent you for them to get credit for that. So can we do, can we, can we do that for each other? Uh, I, I should get started right now and just tell you all the people here that have businesses and Daniel's Barbershop downtown, you need to help, you need to go with him. When you do electrical in a commercial building, see John Hilton. Uh, if, if you, I, I could just go on and on and on. Where do I, where do I stop? I'm going to offend somebody. Dr. Kant's a great doctor. Go see him. Uh, huh? Uh, we've got caterers that, that are, where are they? Iglesias. Iglesias. Over here, do caterers. You know, we could go on and on. A lot of people aren't here today. Uh, I was telling somebody just a moment ago, it's Super Bowl Sunday. So somebody should have told all those people that Super Bowl doesn't start till 5 o'clock who stayed home. But, yeah, tell them the rapture. Yeah, well, if the rapture happened, then we're the ones that are left. So we don't want to go that, that route. Go ahead and turn your Bibles again to John chapter 14. Going to continue with, with, uh, with uh, being in a relationship with Jesus, what that really means. Also want to recognize, I know a lot of preliminary stuff today, but it's good stuff. I also want to recognize a couple that, mean the world to us, close friends of Lori and I and many of you in the church, Amen. and uh, that would be John and Debbie Hilton. Let's give them a yeah. uh, that one. Now, those of you that know who I'm talking about, the Ninos are with us today, back here. I don't know if you guys are splitting up or what, but they're... Uh, Les was an elder here for many years. They were, they were here kind of like uh, just right after the church began. And they served at New Life for 17 years, raised their children here who have gone on to do great things and are going on to do great things for the Lord. And, and so it's good to have you guys with us. Right? I would say, Les, come sing a special, but he would take me up on it, so <laughs> I'm not going to say that today. Uh, okay, so in your Bibles, John chapter 14. Jim, if, if I could possibly get a little more volume, I don't know if I'll feedback or whatever, but if possible. I'd appreciate that. Okay, John chapter 14. Let me just begin by this, just a quick reminder. Um, we've been talking about, for those of you that have not been here, uh, we've been talking about what it means to be in a relationship with God. It's, it's not, obviously, not the same thing as being a religious person. I'm unloading my pockets, taking a weight off, a burden off my shoulder. Uh, it's not the same thing as being religious. Many people say they're Christians, they know the Lord. 80% of Americans claim Christianity, and yet a very small percentage of those actually have a relationship with Christ, as in most every religion. That's pretty common in religions. It's pretty common in Christian churches. People to claim to adhere to a religious uh, belief system, yet they don't live what that belief system teaches. The result of that is, would obviously, uh, the whole sense of hypocrisy and, and a lot of people don't want anything to do with the Christian church because they've seen too many of those people and they think that's who we are they don't understand that those of us who, you and I have a relationship with Christ that it goes much deeper than a set of beliefs 
uh, it is a belief, not a set of belief, beliefs that we adhere to. We believe that there is one God, that He created us in His own image, in His likeness. We believe that He created us with a free will because He has a free will. And He wanted to be loved and to be honored as a creator and as God and as Father to us all. And we all dishonored Him and fell into sin at some point. That actually the sins of our forefathers were passed down and we were born. As the Bible says, David was conceived in his mother's womb in sin. When David was born, and he is like all of us, we are born sinners because of the sin of our forefathers. And the Bible says that life is in the blood. So our blood is where we get our life from. And we inherited, if you want to say genetically, I don't know, but definitely spiritually, in our blood system, the blood that we receive from the father, not the mother. See, this is how you know if a child, who the father is, you get the blood test done, right? Because the blood reveals who the father is. And the Bible doesn't say the sins of your mothers were passed down. It says the sins of your fathers were passed down to the third and fourth generations. And so it is that and in Leviticus, life is in the blood, Scripture tells us. So sin and death and, and, uh, and uh, the fallen nature of man began with Adam when he disobeyed God and it was passed to his children and to their children and to as many as are far off, which includes you and I. So we were born, we were conceived in sin when our father's blood met with our mother's seed. Sin was there present. And we were born sinners. The Bible says that God said, is my hand too short that I cannot reach you? Is my ear deaf that I cannot hear you? But your iniquities, your sins have separated you from me. We were born isolated, cut off, separated from God. We needed a Savior. We needed somebody to help us. Now, here's the problem. We couldn't save ourselves because dead people can't help themselves, and we were born spiritually dead, which meant to be cut off. A dead body, I'm working at a funeral home now doing some part-time gigs, you know. And uh, I got to, uh, I, you know, I, I do visitations and funerals, just a little something I'm doing. And I'm actually doing it, like I told you before, to meet people and build relationships in the community. I got to get outside the church, and it's a way to do that. When, when I look at someone in those coffins, I never feel like there's a person there. Because there's not. There's a body there. There's clay there. There's what will be ashes or clay. Because that body... That life has separated. Death is separation from the body. That's all death is. So spiritual death is separation from God the Father. And the Bible says that when we sinned, we died spiritually. We were cut off from our Heavenly Father. He said, if you sin to Adam, you surely shall die. And Adam sinned, and Adam died. But Adam didn't fall over dead, did he? He lived, the Bible says, to be as much as 950, 40 or 50 years old. Things were different in that time. I mean, there's scientific evidence to explain why that happened and everything. But he continued to live. Did God not tell the truth? No, God told the truth. He died immediately spiritually. He was cut off from God. He ran out, and he, he ran out of God's presence and tried to hide himself because suddenly he was not feeling acceptance from his heavenly Father. He felt separated, cut off from his father. He felt a shame because his sin was exposed. And we all get ashamed when our sin gets exposed, right? So he went out. They sowed figs, leave, fig leaves and tried to hide their nakedness, thinking that that was going to help them. And God said, Adam, where are you? And so God cries out today, where are you to each one of us? Where am I? What's going on in my life? And, and where are you? why are you hiding from me? And God wants us to come out of our shame and say, I'm right here, but I'm a sinner. And when we do that, he'll say, look, I just want you to be my son. I want to pull you in. I want to father you. I want to, I want, I want, I want to be here for you. I want to save you. I want to help you. And so he said, the problem is this. When somebody dies, somebody has to, when somebody sins, somebody has to die for sin. Because God said, if you sin, you surely shall die. Is everybody tracking with me on this? If you sin, you surely shall die. And so, Adam 
though he lived on in his physical body and eventually did die physically, spiritually, emotionally, and physically, even though he did eventually die, uh, he could not die for his sin to pay for his sin because he was dead spiritually. And so was his son and their children and their children all the way down to you and I. So God had a plan, a way to save the world, to save the lost, to save those that he so desperately loved and created. And that plan was to send his son who would not have the blood of a father. So he was born of a virgin. That was prophesied 400 years before Christ was born. It was written, it was written 400 years prior to Christ's birth. And he would be born of a virgin. You can't take the virgin birth out of, out of, out of Christianity or you take, you take the heart of Christianity away. Everything hinges on the virgin birth. Mary, the Holy Spirit overshadowed her, and she was with child. And what that meant is the Holy Spirit hovered over her, and he spoke into her womb and said, Let there be again, and there was a second man. And that second man came to be, and he was Christ, the Savior. And he had no blood from the male, and so he had no sin from Adam. Romans calls him the second Adam. It says the first Adam, because of the first Adam, we all have sinned. But because of the second Adam, we all have life eternal. Amen. Those of who choose to accept his death and punishment. So, now we had another man living without sin. Who, if he lived his entire life without sinning, he could step up and say, I want to take the place of those who sinned. I want to pay their punishment and he could die, and he did that, and Jesus Christ died on the cross and gave his life for us. His blood that was shed, the Bible says, cries out in heaven for us today. You know why that is? Because it cannot die. His blood cannot die. Where his blood dripped to the ground, that blood is somewhere in the earth still living cells. It cannot die. It was eternal. Except that he gave himself up. And he said, okay, I give my life away. When he did that, then his body died. And everything, everything connected with that. Okay, his body died. God said, because you made that sacrifice for the world, I'm going to raise you from the dead. And God raised him from the dead. Everything came back to life in his eternal state. No more, his body no lo, no, can no longer suffer corruption like yours and ours won't after we're resurrected. And today, we now can be reunited with the Father in heaven and have a relationship with him that our sin doesn't separate us from him any longer. If we come by way of the cross where Christ died and reunited us. You may have seen before, the illustration that's used a lot when witnessing to people. It's a great illustration, very simple. But it's an illustration of, like, let's just say, right here is the Grand Canyon, you know, and it's, it's a deep valley, and here are, you know, it comes like this, and it drops off. And it shows man over here and God over here, and man's reaching, trying to connect with God, and he can't get to God because of the great chasm. And so in this illustration, you've got God reaching for man. <laughs> And God wants to connect with man. Inside of us, there's always, there's always been a longing to know God. This is why every human being that has ever lived, whether he lives in a tribal, tribal country or tri tribal uh, people out in a third world country out in the woods, every living soul has always asked, is there a God? Has always had that, that thing inside of them. They look to the skies. They look to the mountains. They, they worship the nature because they're trying to find God. And so, here, here you've got this. And so, in this illustration, God lays a cross that becomes a bridge across that chasm. And so, man can walk across the bridge, if you will, the cross, to be reunited with God. Everybody follow that? So, here we are today, and God is wanting a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with you. Okay? And we have a need for that. Amen. A lot of people don't realize their need for that. But we have a need for that. And so, in John chapter 14, verse 21, I've read a verse of Scripture for the last three, two weeks that we've covered this. 
But I didn't go ahead and read the next three verses to continue the context. And I want to do that as we start this morning. We're going to continue talking about what does it mean to really be in relationship with God. What does that really mean and how can I do that? How, you know, what's a good picture of that? So John 14, 21 says, Jesus said, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. And so I told you what that meant. I've talked about this verse a lot in the past because it's my favorite verse. That Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, I will come to you and manifest myself to you. Right? I'll expose myself. Talked about in a marriage relationship. And it should be in a marriage relationship. That you first expose yourself to another human being. And you're totally open and you're bare and you're saying, here I am. You can have everything. You can see everything about me. I'm not going to hide anything anymore again. If you're truly in relationship with God, that's where, if you're not there, that's where you're headed. And, that, and, so, and it takes a lifetime for us to get there because we're human. But that's what he's trying to do. And so, but I didn't continue. So let's keep reading verse 22. And Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? In other words, how are you going to do this? How are you going to make yourself known to us, but you're not going to do it to everybody else? Why would, you, why would you do just for us, Lord? And Jesus said, answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, everybody say anyone. anyone. Are you an anyone? Yes. How many anyones do we have? Okay. He said, If anyone loves me, is that relational or what? If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. If anyone loves me, my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. That's relationship. You see very clearly. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which I hear, which you hear, is not mine, but it's the Father's who sent me. Tammy gave me some uh, d uh, CDs this week from Creflo Dollar, and he touched on this scripture. And he said something that, that I think is really pertinent that we need to look at, and that is this. He said, Jesus did not say, if anyone loves me, he will keep the Ten Commandments. He did not say, if anyone loves me, he will keep the 600 plus laws in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. He didn't say, if somebody loves me, they will keep the 14,000 laws that the Pharisees have written up. He didn't say, if anybody, he didn't say any of that. He said, if anybody loves me, he will keep my commandments. Now, we understand that the Ten Commandments are his commandments, right? But they're inherent in, or they're laden in, in his commandments. His commandment is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, and all your soul. Love God with everything inside of you. Everything you have belongs to Him now. Everything you are is His right to use. Everything you possess no longer belongs to you. you everything, your past is no longer your past. You don't have to feel awful about it because you gave it to him and he's going to do something with that now. He's going to take what was meant for your harm and destruction and turn it around and make something good out of it. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your strength. That means it takes a little effort on our part. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your strength, all of your mind, all of your will, all of your soul, everything in you, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself, right? So it's when we put God first and our neighbor, get this, on the same level as ourselves, that God will then come to us and manifest himself to us. He said, God, what do I need to get that relationship that sister so-and-so has. Man, she just is so full of joy. She's full of Jesus. She talks to God all the time. She loves God. The Lord's working in her life. What do I need to get that, Father? He said, it's not really that hard. Just love on me and love my people. Amen. Well, 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 that's good, Jesus, but that, that's too easy. I mean, certainly there, you know, is there, is there like a uh, pyramid with some stairs I can crawl up? Somewhere? 
You know, Lord, uh, can I, can I, can I, uh, uh, can, can you give me a figure of money? And once I pay that amount of money, then I'll be in right relationship. Come on, Lord, is it a million dollars? I'll work the rest of my life and give you every dime I have if eventually I can buy my way. He says, no, that's not it. He said, all I'm saying is love me and put yourself on the same plane as everybody else. It's really not so much always lifting people up in your heart as it is sometimes pushing you down in your heart. Anybody understand that? <laughs> You know what? The world doesn't understand that. They don't get that. They think it's about, okay, I'm going to bring you up to my greatness. <laughs> That's what John said. I must decrease that he might increase in my life. So how do I get God to manifest himself to me? How do I get Jesus to come and become so real to me that I no longer have to work at being a Christian, make sure I prayed enough that day, covered all of my sins in my prayer, prayed for every sick person I know, read enough of my Bible, all the rules, all the expectations. All that stuff does not get God to manifest himself to you. Now, he will manifest himself to you in that stuff when you do the other first. But it's first, it's about loving him so that he can go into the, are you ready for this, inner chamber and begin to expose to you. Watch this. The Bible says, he, 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 it says, to Moses, he showed him his ways, but to Israel, he showed them his acts. What that meant, that's a perfect picture of the church. There are so many people in the church that just, I just, I'll believe when I see it. I believe when God does this in my life. I believe when this thing quits happening or when I get healed of this. or I, God, I'll believe when you act in my situation. And, but to Moses, God showed him his ways. That's why he does what he does. And sometimes he doesn't do what we think he ought to do. How we think he ought to do it. Because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. They're much higher than we are. He sees the end from the beginning. He knows if I do this now, and it's not time for that, it's going to lead you this direction. But if I let you sit in that cesspool a little bit longer, or circumstance, or trial a little bit longer, it's going to change and break something in you that will change the way you're pulling like a car with a bad tire pulls to one side. God's got to pump that tire up in our life and get us back in alignment so we'll continue going what's eventually going to be our prosperity and success in life and our understanding and having a revelation of who he is. Anybody say amen to that? Amen. So bring that into your marriage. That's why your wife torments you, sir. In our stress, in our circumstances, in our relationships, and things aren't going well, and you're butting heads, and there's, the Bible says iron sharpens iron. And we are helping define what a good relationship is when we're struggling with each other. It's, you know, it's like the gears, okay, two sets of gears. I don't know if this is going to make sense. This is coming out of my head right now. Maybe it's out of the spirit. Who knows? Two sets of gears are working together, right? But they're grinding on each other because one of them is not quite set to, to spec like it should be. And so in our relationships, we grind on each other. And so the longer we grind, some people just disengage and say, I'm not, I'm not going to deal with that stress. I'm going to find somebody that I can mesh with. And guess what? You're right. That person is not out there. right because they didn't they didn't figure him right either when he was cut out of the, mo out of the mold he was cut out so but what happens is that gear that's out of sync will eventually wear down one of the two gears the stronger of the gear will survive now that sounds scary when you're thinking relationship because you're thinking that means the dominant figure is going to override and wear the other one down. You follow what I mean by the gear will eventually wear out and it'll have no gears, no, no uh, those on it. What do you call those? Teeth? There you go. Huh? Cobs. Teeth. Cobs. Yeah. 
corn cob, tea, whatever. But once those are worn down, there's no longer resistance. Things don't move like they used to move, but there's no resistance. But here's what happens. In the, in, in a, in the kingdom, in, in a, a Christian family, the stronger of the two is not the dominant figure. The stronger of the two is the most meek and humble and mild figure. Because in your meekness, you're not going to wear down. Does that, does that make sense? And so, God wants to put us together. Iron sharpens iron. It makes things work together better than they should. <laughs> so, Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me and you love your neighbor and you put yourselves on the same plane and everybody else's good is, is as important as your good is, he said, then I'm going to get in the middle of that. And I'm going to come down. I'm going to manifest myself to you. And I'm going to let you know who I am. And I'm going to let you see who I am. And I'm going to tell you something. It'll tear you apart when you see that. It'll change your world. So, every one of us, as we've been saying the last couple of weeks, all of us want a relationship with God. First point was this. Our relationship is not based on our works or what we do because we've already fallen short. Our relationship is based on Him and what He has done. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For he loved us while we were yet sinners. Christ died, the just for the unjust. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called his children. Why? Because we're really sinners, but he chose to love us. This relationship, he, John, 1 John or 2 John or 3 John, he says, one of the three, for he first loved us. I think it's 1 John. So our relationship with him begins with him ought to be why we love him desperately and dearly because when we were unlovable Christ died the just for the unjust so the good news is that you and I can have an intimate relationship with Jesus I told you last week I read the definition a relationship is the way in which two people or groups or countries etc talk behave toward and deal with each other it's the way in which people connect Everybody's relationships are different. We connect on different planes, different levels. There are different things that we're doing. So having a relationship with God then is the idea that we can walk and talk with him like we would anybody else on earth. I don't know if I pointed this out last week. Did I? Yeah, I think I did. The old gospel hymn. And he walks with me and talks with me, tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we travel there, none other has ever known. Talking about the fact that no one has the relationship with God that you have. Your relationship with him is going to be different. And he walks with me, and he talks to me, Brian, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we travel there, nobody else has ever known. You guys don't know my relationship, and I don't know yours. And you don't know the person across the aisle from you. And to look across there and say they don't know Jesus like I do, some of us are going to be, be greatly shocked when we get to heaven and you look over and you see old brother so and so sitting in Jesus lap and they got you tied to a tree down by the river <laughs> where did that come from right <laughs> okay so the Bible was written in part to show us how people related to God in times past so I've been thinking over the last few weeks as I meditate on this last month or so Lord, show me some relationships in the Bible. People who had relationship with God. So as I've thought about that, Wendy, all I can think of is there, every one of them was that. So I got overwhelmed. I'm like, all right, so which one of these do I use? This week I've been listening to Ruth uh, on, on the iPhone. Listen to the book of Ruth. You know, God chose Ruth out of a foreign land. She was a foreign lady. She was a foreigner alienated from the kingdom of God and, and, I, and I read about Ruth and God sent a family if you will where she's concerned actually they went because they got out of the will of God but this family comes to where she is the son marries her which brings her legally into the family of, of, of the Israelites God's chosen people in the day and the husband dies, stepfather, uh, father dies, da, 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 everybody dies, all the men die. And Ruth 
and Naomi come back. And they come back to their homeland, and Naomi says, I'm a bitter woman. They said, welcome home, Naomi. And she said, don't say that to me. I'm a bitter woman. Basically, God took my husband and my two sons, and I'm left with nothing. But she didn't know she had something great. She had Ruth. And what she didn't know was Ruth, though her son had died, was going to carry on her family name all the way to the lineage of Christ. Amen. She didn't understand that. And so she sends her, her Ruth, uh, Ruth makes a commitment. You remember the story, those of you that know the story. Ruth makes a commitment, a covenant to stand with Naomi. And she said, your God shall be my God. Your people shall be my people. So she chooses Christ at that point, if you will. They get back to their land. They're poor. They have nothing to eat. God set a part, a, a part of the field, if you remember from the law, that they were to leave the corners of the field and not harvest everything so the poor and needy could actually go out and harvest the corners. They would have something to eat. That's, that's the way God is. He always leaves something for everybody. And so Naomi sent Ruth out to harvest corners of the field. And then a man, Boaz, comes along and sees her, finds out her need and who she is, and he says, look, don't, you don't need to be... You don't need to be reaping here. There's a lot of crazy young men here. Get over there with the women and hang with them, and I'll make sure you get something to eat. So out of the goodness of Boaz's heart, he just says, I'm going to take care of this woman and, this, and Naomi. I'm going to help them out. So he does that. She goes back, brings in, and he gives her a lot of extra stuff, and she goes back, brings it in, says to Naomi. Naomi says, w where'd you get all the food from? I ran into this man, blah, blah. And she said, guess what? He's a kinsman redeemer which was a law, in the law. If you had a brother who was to die and there was a, a brother or a near kin in the family, that near kin, nearest of kin, was to take that woman to become his wife, to bear children, to carry on the name of the man who died. And so, so the story is, you know, one thing leads to another. She goes and Naomi says, you go into his, his house where he's at and you lay, or where he stays. You lay down at his feet. When he wakes up, you tell him who you are and what's going on and, and that you're there to serve him. And so she does that. He realizes what, what is happening here, that she's coming to become, to be redeemed by him. Now, that means that she will become his wife if he, if she does, it, if he does this. He gives her a whole lot of barley and says, take that home and I'll take care of some things today. So Naomi said, y'all hang out. said, you just hang out, Ruth. This man's going to take care of it today. You know why? Because he had already said, he said, he said, woman, he said, you don't understand the kindness that you have shown me. When he wakes up and she's at, her, at his feet, and he said, you don't never understand the kindness you've shown me. He said, you could have gone with any young man, but you chose me. Now, all of you old guys know what that meant, right? Okay. <laughs> and, so, and so he said, you don't understand the kindness that you've shown me. And so the next day, he goes to the, the gate of the city where they do all their transactions and the court, court things are taken care of. He waits for the nearest of kin to come by because there's only one more. He comes by, and he pulls him in. He says, come in here. We need to talk. He said, listen, he said, there's, there's a woman here, Naomi. She's got some land she's trying to sell, and you're the nearest of kin. You, you get first choice at buying that. That was also a part of it. Would you like to buy the land? He said, I'll take it. And he said, well, there's a catch. He said, if you take that, there's also a daughter-in-law that comes with the deal. And you have to take her. And he said, well, he said, I can't do that. That will mess up my inheritance as it is. You know what that means? His wife's going to beat the snot out of him. <laughs> he said, can't go there, buddy. So they go through the transaction. He buys Ruth. And this is the best way I can put it. That's as clear as it gets. He bought her. He redeemed her. He didn't know her. And this is a picture or a type of Christ of what he's done for all of us. We are that stranger, alienated, as Paul says, alienated from Christ, having no way to become a, a to, to enter into the promises of Abraham. And yet... Somebody came along who knew that we were not truly in the family, except now there was a legal avenue. There was a legal way that we could be brought in and we could become an heir of the kingdom. And the Bible says that after it happened, that there was a 
blessing spoken over her that he would bless the fruit of her body. And what that means is this. When we, Jesus came and he is our kinsman redeemer. We first had to come to him. Knowing that we're isolated, we first had to come to him. Lay down at his feet and say, I'm all yours. I'm here willing to be totally exposed and intimate with you if you will take me in and care for me. That's where we're at with Christ. And he gave all that he had. He paid the price. He had already given her <clears throat> large amounts of, 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 uh, of grain, of gifts, given gifts, to woo her in. But get this. The thing that brought her to Boaz was what she could get out of it. So we need to understand this. We come to Christ for what we get out of it. That's just the truth. Yet, he died for what we could get out of it. And this is the covenant, the relationship that we have with the Lord. That we come to him for what we can get. He came to us for what we can get. He first loved us. And so, if we will come and throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus, expose ourselves to him, and say, I'm willing to become, in, to come into covenant with you, to marry Jesus, then he will take us in and become a husband to us and begin to care for us. I think that's cool. And so, and, and throughout the... Uh, Throughout the Bible, men had real relationship with God. This is not something new. Christianity is not a, 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 an American religion. We haven't fallen onto something that nobody knew. Men have been in relationship with God since Adam. Enoch walked with God and was no more. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Gideon was behind the, uh, the press. I mean, the, the, uh, the, he was treading out. Yeah. And he was hiding out. And God called to him and said, Oh, mighty man of valor. While he was a chicken. Why did he do that? Because God was in relationship with Gideon. And he knew his potential. And he knew his future, though Gideon didn't know it. And he knew that Gideon didn't even know that Gideon was a man of valor. And that when he was put into a battle situation, he would rise to the occasion and he'd be the man of God he was created to be. So you may feel like a weakling and a loser right now. And you may be the person that kicks the devil in the rear end two, two days from now. Because it's not, Christ, it's not us, it's Christ in us who is the hope of glory. And God saw that and God knew that about him. Abraham was called what? The friend of God. Jacob wrestled with God and had his hip dislocated and it changed his walk. And to this very day, people around the globe speak of Israel and they say their God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he had to be changed and that change came when he wrestled with God. In relationships, you're going to wrestle. You're going to fight. You're going to stress, strain. There's going to be stress. There's going to be difficulty. There's going to be time that you look up and say, God, where are you? And he's going to say, I'm right here. Boom. And you go, bam, you punch back. Listen, you hear what I'm saying? No, y'all didn't even understand that. If, you, if you're in relationship with him, you understood what I just said. It's wrestling with God. It's grabbing him around the neck and throwing him to the ground and saying, I don't get this. And he flips you over, grabs you in the leg, and goes, pop, bang, and your hip pops out, and you never walk the same again. But it's because you went into the dark place alone, in the secret place with him, and you said, I'm not going out of this room until you answer me. People have always, there have always been men and women and children who have had relationships with God. Samuel, laying in his bed, trying to go to sleep, got nervous leg syndrome, sitting there laying there, can't go to bed because he's a wired up kid, and suddenly he hears God call his name. 
You know, God has been in relationship with people from the beginning of time. David was called a man after God's own heart. Jesus chose 12 personal disciples. Do you know there were a lot of other people that hung around Jesus, that followed him? He had a huge party of people, but there were 12 that were personal to him. Well, you mean Jesus' favored people? Absolutely. In his humanity, because he was human. I mean, I like all of y'all a whole lot more than I like the people down at First Baptist. I'm sorry. <laughs> I ain't saying there's anything wrong with them. They're just not you. There's nothing wrong with that. He was in relationship with 12 in a way he wasn't. He was in relationship with three in the way he wasn't with the other nine. He had the inner circle, Peter, Peter, James, and John. He had a deep relationship with him. Then there was one who thought he was the most loved. And that was John, called John to be loved. And, and, and he said of himself many times that uh, he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. I always get a kick out of that. You know why I said that? Because he felt so much love radiating from Jesus that he thought nobody can, 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 can have the relationship I got with Jesus. Me and Jesus got the thing going on. And you know what? I dare say every one of them felt that way. Because, because you know why? Their relationship's not the same as your relationship. Yeah. And you ought to feel that way with Jesus. I heard, I, heard, uh, I was listening to somebody else preach or teach this week. I don't know. And uh, it was a lady, and she was talking about when she was young, when she first got saved. And I honestly remember this, too. She was embarrassed taking a shower because she just had got saved. The, the presence of God had become so real and, and, and tangible to her that in the shower, she said, I was embarrassed that God saw me naked. Now, I want you to hear what she just said. I remember those feelings myself. I remember saying something that I shouldn't have said or thinking something and just feeling so bad. And still, times where it's like, okay, God knows that. Are you in a relationship with him? I mean, is it that real to you? It, it can be if it's not. Two more, and I'm through with this. Jesus saw Nathaniel under the tree praying, and he declared, there's a man in whom there is no guile. Now, Nathaniel said, how'd you, how'd you know that about me? And he said, well, I saw you when you were under the tree. But Nathaniel knew that Jesus wasn't anywhere near the tree, that Jesus had seen him in the Spirit. But Jesus was building relationship with Nathaniel. And he said, there's a man who doesn't have any guile, no deceit. He's just, he's just a straight-up, pure-hearted person. Barnabas, in the New Testament, his name was Son of Encouragement. So God knew that, and he loved that quality about Barnabas. So he gave Barnabas a specific work to do in the New Testament. You should read about Barnabas. Name means son of encouragement. He became an encourager uh, in the early church that had a lot to do with strengthening and building the early church and spreading the gospel around the globe. Amen? Well, guess what? Here's what I'm going to do. I, that was my introduction. So, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> And I think I have one more week next week that I'll be able to uh, dedicate to talking about this. Got just a few more very simple things, ways to know how and what, how to relate to Jesus. I started last week, as I said, you, those of you that were here talked about the gift. And I've got about three or four more that I'm going to touch on next week, and I'll be through with this, I think. After that, the weekend will be the parent conference. Dr. Kant will be sharing in that. He's going to be teaching on the healthy home. And uh, looking forward to that. Dr. Donahue. Uh, Dr. Donahue is a retired pediatrician from Franklin. He has, two of his sons are executive physicians on the Vanderbilt staff. He has a daughter who's a lawyer and another child, I don't know if it's a girl or boy, who also is in medicine of some sort. And he has raised those children to love the Lord. And so he's written several books on parenting, effective parenting, things that he learned from being a pediatrician and working with kids. And so he's going to be here to share. James Martin, no relation to me, will be 
he, he years ago was the director of the Boys and Girls Club here in Columbia, if any of you happen to know him. Today he works with an organization. He travels around the state dealing with juvenile delinquents and helping them and working with them one-on-one. He's going to be sharing with us, and he's going to be sharing on the topic of parents, you are a role model. And he's going to share on that. And then I'm going to probably share a little bit myself. But that's going to be a great day. So we really want to encourage you, if you're a parent, grandparent, or a human being, you need to be here because this is really going to be good. I mean, we've got these are top-notch speakers that we have coming in, and, uh, and it's going to be a good time. It's going to be from 9 to noon on Saturday, March the 1st, Brother Con. <laughs> March the 1st, I think, is when we're doing it. It's going to be a good time. And then the following day, uh, Dr. Donahue will, will stay over and he will do it, uh, our Sunday morning service. So that's kind of where we're headed. Everybody happy? Amen. Everybody love Jesus? Amen. Amen. Are you glad he first loved you? Yes. Because he did. So let's pray. Father, we love you because you first loved us. And uh, that's not only a scripture, that's, that's the cry of our heart. We love you because you first loved us. Man, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called his children. While we were yet sinners, Christ died, the just for the unjust. But we're so humbled, so honored, that you have chosen us from all of the people of the earth to come in to your household and be a part of the family of God. And we're, we're humbled by that. We're not arrogant or proud of it. We're not better than anybody else. We're humbled and broken, God. And we thank you for your goodness and your love. And I just pray, Father, for everyone here, that all of us, beginning with me, that we will grow deeper and deeper and deeper in our relationship with you, and we'll learn how to expose ourselves to you, to let you see who we really are in our heart. And... In that, you will be able to show us what things we need to remove that are keeping us in a place where you can't fully reveal yourself to us. And we want to know you. We want to know you, Father. We love you and thank you. If you're here this morning, I know most of us here are uh, members of New Life for the majority, uh, part of New Life and your regulars here. Even, Even that being the case, some of you may be hearing some things and you're thinking you know I really I don't have that kind of relationship with the Lord and I want to go deeper so if you're here and you've never met Jesus you never even you don't know him at all you've heard about him maybe but you don't know him personally if you were to die today you can't say for sure that you would go to be with him because you don't know him and the Bible says until you know him that you will not have eternal life. But he offers that to us this morning. And so you're, this morning, if that's you and you say, Pastor, I want to become a Christian. I want to know this Jesus that you're talking about. Just tell me how to do that and I'll do it. If that's you, we want to pray for you. So if you just hold your hand up and say, that's me, pray for me. You don't have anything to be ashamed of. The rest of us here have all done this. And Jesus says, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you when it comes time for you to stand before my Father. But right now, you're just saying, Pastor, I'm ready to become a Christian. I want to make that step. If he's real, and he'll manifest himself to me like you say he will, then I'm ready to step up and say, okay, I'm going to give you a chance, Lord. Let's do this together. If that's you, raise your hand up. Say, it's me. Pray for me. Anybody? Okay. I want to ask another question. We like it. Christians, we like it. When the preacher says, keep your head up, so we can look around and see who it is. So keep your head up, and I want to ask you. (laughs) You're a believer, and you're here, and you say, you know what? I want to go deeper. I want to know him like I've never known him. Man, I want that real personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Pastor, pray for me today. If that's you, raise your hand up. Doesn't that feel good? That feels good. One thing, you know, I don't, I don't have this in my notes. I should make it a point next week. Another thing about a relationship is there's no shame about who you're with. Amen. You, you may have the ugliest woman on earth, but you're so proud of her. That was a joke. 
She's not ugly to you. No, I'm just saying. In relationship, there's no shame. You, you, you tell everybody, I'm with so-and-so. You know, and that's the way it is with Jesus. You tell everybody. All right? Stand up. Throw your hands up to the Lord and love on him for a minute. Father, we love you. We bless you.